Kyoto Animation's 2007 series Lucky Star is one of the most fascinating animated experiments of the late 2000s. If Seinfeld was a show about nothing, Lucky Star is somehow about even less than that. A show where most episodes don't have any unifying plot, and most of the scenes just sort of meander between punchlines as the characters naturalistically go about their everyday lives. The tone shifts pretty hard from the early episodes into the later ones to become more exciting and forthrightly entertaining, with even some emotional beats and surprising plot evolutions in later episodes, but none of that left quite the mark on culture that the very first episode's infamous first half did with its long, pointless, meandering discussion of how the main characters enjoy various snacks. In spite of the size of its reputation, I think it would be a huge stretch to consider Lucky Star particularly revolutionary, or even all that influential. It wasn't a huge success initially, and was in fact so lukewarm at first that its original director was quickly fired after four episodes, and the show changed its focus going forward. Lucky Star was more heavily discussed among Western anime fan circles than in Japan, but not even so much out of love as out of representing the moment when a totally pointless piece of moe trash finally made it close enough to the mainstream of online anime fandom that the fans of manly anime started to feel threatened to the point of open warfare against moe fans. In the end, cuteness won because the Japanese fandom doesn't really care about what the West thinks and was already way high up on the Moe wave by the time that Lucky Star hit. Most of the influence that Lucky Star did have piggybacked off of the enormous influence and success of Kyoto Animation's previous work from a year before, The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya. Haruhi was an overnight sensation that made its titular protagonist into the most popular anime character in the world for a couple of years, and in turn did the same for her voice actress, Hirano Aya-san. Casting Hirano-san as the otaku protagonist of Lucky Star, Izumi Kono, and then acknowledging Konata as a fan of Haruhi was a brilliant way to connect her directly to the audience that was already in love with that show. And it drove a lot of the initial discussion and attention towards Lucky Star, even if some of that ended up being negative. People really wanted Haruhi Season 2 very badly in 2007, and getting a show that makes reference to Haruhi and uses its leading voice actress for 24 episodes of aimless gag comedy in a totally different genre when there wasn't even an announcement of Haruhi Season 2 yet was taken by a slap in the face by a lot of that show's fans, and it wouldn't be the last time that Kyoto Animation made those fans feel that way. Not that I think they were completely to blame for this, the publishers were the ones really in charge of this whole franchise. While Lucky Star director Yamakan was not the director of Haruhi, I think his unique role as a series organizer and the choreographer of the famous ending dance played a massive role in the show's ability to succeed. The Hare Hare Yukai dance was a viral meme around the world for a solid two years, and decisions Decisions like broadcasting the episodes out of order and starting with a mysterious student film adapting a later light novel story, as well as creating a sort of light ARG website to promote the series and other unique release gimmicks made Haruhi feel like this huge multimedia experiment and cultural event. It's not a surprise that Yamakan tried to go for a similarly weird approach to structuring and marketing Lucky Star, and that the opening theme song dance did successfully transcend into meme status, but it was also heavily derided at the time for writing on the success of the Hare Hare Yukai, and for being a much more hyperactive, over-the-top song, which many listeners found unpalatably dempa. Not me, though, I love that shit! Dun dun do dun dun, let's get cherry pie, da dun go gay gun, you get sensation, hi, sensei kan, den den jo wak se, hara hara huru huru horo horo horo! I am a general appreciator of Lucky Star, and some of its gimmicks are some of my favorite things about the show. Every episode has its own ED, for instance. The first half is always the girls doing kind of classic songs, including obscure anime openings, and the second half is all these bizarre songs made up by hilarious voice actor and radio personality Shirai Shiminoru doing a cappella renditions of songs that he would eventually release on his own weird ass album, of which I may have been the world's biggest fan. Shiraishi and his co-host Kogami Akira also run the Lucky Channel segment at the end of each episode, which is basically an animated adaptation of a radio show that already existed and was sort of tacked into Lucky Star as a cross-promotional gimmick, thanks to the fact that Shirai Shiminoru played a minor character in Haruhi who had become a meme for the way that he sings the line wa 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 
loosely meaning forgot my something. The Lucky Channel segments comment on the main show while telling their own weird contained narrative that gets more fleshed out as the series goes and ends up being one of its most memorable aspects. I think it is of dire importance to note Lucky Star's relationship to audio dramas and radio programs, which are aspects of otaku culture that tend to go completely unacknowledged by most of the non-Japanese fan base simply because it's difficult to subtitle an audio-only medium. And there's never been a ton of interest or effort made to translate most of this ancillary audio content that exists for anime and manga. I've made the comparison in the past between these conversational comedies about cute girls doing cute things and the appeal of podcasts and let's plays, wherein the main point is just appreciating the charisma of the performers and listening to them interact. Lucky Star has superb, inviting, and soothing visual design with a lovely color palette, tons of amazing outfits, and adorable character designs which make it an easy sensory experience. All of the slow, minimal music is highly memorable and you're going to be hearing it all throughout this video. But the main thrust of it really is about the voice acting. Lucky Star feels definitionally like something that's meant to be left on in the background and just sort of casually absorbed as part of the atmosphere. Hell, there's a scene in the show itself where Konata is watching Haruhi in the background while posting on message boards, and it's obviously meant to be a mirror moment for the viewer. Again, I don't want to overstate the specialness of Lucky Star's meta-ness. Self-referential otaku media goes all the way back to Gainax's Otaku no Video from 1991, and was going strong around the time of this show's release, not too long after the likes of Genshiken and again Haruhi. Cute girls had been doing cute things like this since at least Azumanga Daio, and the first season of Hitamari Sketch went to air a season before Lucky Star, and was my favorite of the two, continuing on for four seasons and a bunch of OVAs. While I maintain that Lucky Star is still one of the best and most unique shows in the genre. I also think it's understandable that Kyoto Animation stepping things up to a whole other level with k and then later with Dragon Maid has kept Lucky Star from holding up as the pinnacle of what even the studio has done with the genre. I think most of us who feel a special connection to Lucky Star do so because we connect with at least a couple of the characters on a special level or we're at the place in the time that it happened. Most likely those characters are Konata and Kagami, and most likely you also used to ship them like I did. Okay, maybe I'm projecting. It's actually kind of hard to understate just how weird the first four episodes directed by Yamakon really are. And I'm not the only person out there who's very curious to know how the whole show would have turned out had he stayed in charge, even if I'm still happy with a lot of what comes after his direct involvement in the show. It's always kind of muddy to understand exactly how much could have changed between the pre-production and writing phases and the actual production phase of the show. And it certainly doesn't feel like a sudden gear shift in episode 5, but by episode 10, there is a very noticeable difference in the tone and flow of the series, following more of the conventional tone and pacing of a four-panel gag comic adaptation, and less of the free-form, naturalistic, conversational approach of Yamakon's episodes. The conversations in these episodes feel the most like real conversations of any I think I've ever seen in media, to an extent that is deliberately frustrating, especially in the first episode, which Yamakon handled personally. There's even a bit where someone joins a conversation and a character re-explains the conversation to get them involved. It's not quite on the level of realistic diction, and the actors are very much performing to sound pleasant and cute on top of whatever other emotions are being expressed in the dialogue, but the flow of the conversations and the way that the characters and their personalities bounce off of one another feels feels decisively real. I think, in fact, it's so real that most viewers completely take that aspect of it for granted in the first episode, and we're just immediately bored with it. Why are they just having a conversation that I would have with my friends? I don't think this is a question that as many of you will find relatable anymore post-pandemic, but as a shut-in through high school who met my best friend, another Hikikomori, because he brought a Japanese Lucky Star promotional book to school, I also found that question unrelatable even back then. I did not have friends with whom I was having these kinds of conversations until we started hanging out. When I was 16, I had grown facial hair that I was too scared to try and shave even though I hated it and was too embarrassed to ask my dad to teach me. I was overweight and had nothing but shitty oversized clothes and long unkempt hair that I didn't know how to take care of, and I basically felt like shit all the time and didn't want anyone to look at me ever, if possible. I would wake up at 4 in the morning each day, watch 3 episodes of a show like Serial Experiments Lane or Haibane Renmei before school, and then come home from school and watch another 3 episodes until my little 
little brother got home, then usually I'd listen to music and write song lyrics on my computer all day while watching him play video games and thinking about how shitty everything is until I fell asleep. When I found my way onto the Mega Tokyo forums around the end of 2006, I saw tons and tons of hype for Haruhi on there and ended up checking it out and instantly boarding that hype train as it became tied as my favorite anime with Evangelion which I'd seen six months prior. As I got deeper involved in the site early in 2007, I discovered the concept of fan-subbed currently airing anime and started with watching the scant translations of Hidamari Sketch, Gaku and Utopia Manabi Straight, and Nodame Cantabile, all for the chance at experiencing the relationships that I was supposed to be having with real people in high school and couldn't. I didn't understand my own trans identity yet and was extremely secretive about the fact that I was watching shows with only girl characters because I didn't know how to answer for why I was so interested in those kinds of shows. Nonetheless, the genre of cute girls doing cute things was an immediate fixation of mine, and even though I actually dropped Lucky Star after 12 episodes while it was airing because I thought it was kind of boring, I ended up rewatching it multiple times with my aforementioned best friend in the coming years and, and falling in love with it the more I understood its sense of humor and all of the cultural references that it makes which I hadn't at first thanks to my lack of exposure to Japanese pop media. Because the scenes in Lucky Star flow with such naturalism, they tend to cover a lot of ground, with tons of distinct little character moments that only really mean as much as you are intrigued with them. The dynamic of the early episodes is mostly thus. Konata is constantly questioning the logic of the world around her and overthinking things, Kagami is usually playing defense for the way that things are and playing the straight man to everybody and countering Konata's logic, and Tsukasa acts as a sort of control, a turbo normie who doesn't particularly think about or question anything and isn't really equipped to counter either of the other's arguments. Miyuki is also a control in another way in that she comes off as not really needing to think about stuff because she's so overwhelmingly intelligent that she just understands everything implicitly. She can very easily settle an argument that revolves around information, but rarely has any kind of strong actual opinions on matters. How each of these characters is uniquely fleshed out comes mostly through examining the particular differences in how they interact with the world around them. Boiling that idea down to its core is what gives us that infamous opening conversation about the best way to eat a chocolate coronet and everything that follows. I personally think that this conversation, especially when we get to the part about how each person passive-aggressively reacts to making sure they get enough meat for themselves during a group hot grill, is maybe the most uniquely intriguing way to establish these girls' personalities. This is a situation we all can relate to, and it's not even so much that each of the girls feels differently about the situation as that they act on their instincts differently to different results. I don't even think it's important necessarily that the characters are consistent in all of their behavior that we learn about, because they throw plenty of curveballs along the way to really stand out as unique people, but it's more so that all of the reactions and behaviors are true enough to life that we can understand the characters in those situations. Again, the power in all of this really relies on how much you care to spend time with these characters. It really is a friendship simulator in the early episodes, with some moments that maybe could cause you to laugh out loud, but mostly that doesn't even seem to be one of its aims until the comedy director takes hold after episode 5. Even though it wears the guise of being a show for male otaku, it's hard for me not to think that Yamakon was going out of his way to make something that he thought girls would relate to and want to watch, a feat which the ladies at KyoAni would eventually accomplished with Kaon, Free, and Violet Evergarden later, among others. And also that guys who want to completely disappear into a world of cutesy feminine interaction, whatever their motivations may be, could blissfully disappear into the dulcet tones of its comfy soundtrack and sweetly voiced girls. I don't think Lucky Star would have been anywhere near as popular as it got to be, even outside Japan, if it hadn't shifted gears after those early episodes. As much as I appreciate what Yamakon was trying to do, it seems like he didn't actually satisfy the audience audiences he was aiming for. In the second episode, Konata complains about the fact that an anime is being made of a manga that she likes and has changed the voice cast from the drama CD adaptations. Maybe this was intended as a concession to Lucky Star fans who'd already heard Hirohashi Ryo-san voicing Konata, along with the rest of the completely different cast of the 2005 drama CD, but it probably felt more like adding insult to injury when Hirano-san was so obviously cast to capitalize on the success of Haruhi. Having said that, I doubt there would have even been a green light for this adaptation of what in my opinion is an incredibly mid-tier manga from 2003 if not for Hirano-san's attachment to it. And so for me and many others, this rounded up as a win. Still, it wasn't good for the initial reaction to the series, nor was having Kona to complain about Haruhi on 2 channel in episode 4. Yamakon was playing into the meta in too much of a contentious way that a lot of fans found alarming, especially in a world without a second season of Haruhi, and
and even more especially in a world still without a third proper season of Full Metal Panic. A lot of the unique flourishes that make Lucky Star lovable to me are partly so because they are my only light tastes of whole universes of otaku culture that I barely know about. Having been a fan of Genshiken before Lucky Star and being deep into otaku media throughout the 2000s, it wasn't necessarily revelatory to me to watch this show outside of those couple of aspects that weren't really touched on by other anime. And so those influences remain one of my favorite things about the show. Even though to people who are actually fans of drama CDs and idol or voice actor driven radio programs, some of the metatextual stuff might seem passe or even strike as insulting. The next anime that I remember heavily incorporating these aspects of the culture and getting meta about the industry side of things without insulting the fans would be Sore Ga Seiyu, which I would also pretty easily recommend to most fans of Lucky Star. I can only speculate about the exact reasons for Yamakon's exile from Lucky Star and Kyoto Animation, but if I had to guess, it's probably because he seems like kind of an unlikable, unstable cunt. Granted, I love the guy. I saw his panel at Otakon one year where he dressed and acted like the hottest shit on earth, only to go reputationally to hell the next year after a string of not only failed original projects, but more pertinently, a consistent tendency to make controversial statements about the fans, the industry, and other creators every chance he gets. Suffice it to say, I think KyoAni was probably raring for the opportunity to drop this douchebag, even if he might have been a bit of a marketing genius, just because he brings a toxic reputation to everything he touches. Yamakan was replaced by the late great Takemoto Yasuhiko-san who had already directed on Haruhi and the hilarious Full Metal Panic Fumofu, and would go on to direct Amagi Brilliant Park, Gyoka, and the first season of Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid before his murder at the hands of an arsonist who attacked Kyoto Animation and killed a large number of employees in 2019. Takemoto-san was a comedic genius and powerhouse storyboard artist and animation director whose influence over modern anime probably hasn't really been fully understood yet. He is a legend in the making and will never be forgotten, including for his excellent work over the rest of this series and turning it into more of an Azumanga Daio or Pony Pony Dash-esque slice-of-life gag comedy. While I'm on the subject of Pony Pony, I think it's fascinating how Lucky Star kind of accomplished for Westerners what the US distributors of that show had seemingly set out to do much harder and failed. You see, Japanese comedies have always struggled with American audiences unless they come off so weird and left field that audiences are amused that such a thing found a way to exist. American anime distributor ADV had hit it big with two shows like that around the turn of the millennium, namely Quack Experimental Anime XL Saga and Azumanga Daio. As such, when 2005's Pony Pony Dash from Studio Shaft basically combined the concepts of both of those shows into one, they jumped on it and pushed it hard as the next big anime comedy. And well, suffice it to say that fewer of you have probably seen Pony Pony than have seen Lucky Star even now. Pony Pony Dash was just way too weird. ADV had a feature which extensively notated all of the Japanese cultural references, but a lot of the show just legitimately didn't make sense if you didn't know a lot of that stuff already, even more so than in the case of Sayonara Zetsubo Sensei, which came from the same staff. XL Saga made a lot of references, but it was much more broad with its genre and style parodies, and mostly referenced other nerdy media that was recognizable to its audience. Lucky Star is closer to Pony Pony in that it references all kinds of cultural stuff that's likely to whiff with a lot of non-Japanese viewers, and it even has some bits that it acknowledges will be difficult to get even for its intended audience. But that wink and nod does a whole lot to at least let the audience know when they're not supposed to get the joke. And the show is also way less dense with references or generally difficult to parse as compared to Pony Pony. That show is seriously unhinged, while Lucky Star is actually down to earth feeling even in comparison to Azumanga Daio, which I also think is why it didn't hit as hard here as that show did culturally in the short term. I think the most important thing this show actually did for Westerners was just to be a lot of people's introduction deeper into otaku culture. But it kind of doesn't matter what your jumping on point is as long as you keep burrowing deeper. Takemoto-san's influence over Lucky Star can be felt especially prominently in episode 6, which is the first one that he directed personally. By this, I mean that Lucky Star had a team of episode directors and storyboard artists handling different episodes, so each of them has kind of a unique feel to it, even beyond the overall tonal shift between the four episodes guided by Yamakan's direction and the rest of the show under Takemoto-san. Episode 6 is a lot more exciting and over-the-top than previous ones, with shifts in animation style for an initial D parody, and lots of snazzy animation cuts. It it feels almost exactly like the standard tonal space that Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid hung in, and I could easily recommend that show to anyone who likes this episode from Lucky Star and vice versa.
The next episode feels closer in tone and pacing to the ones before it, so again, I don't think the show immediately felt like it shifted gears hard when we got here, so much as just like episode 6 was especially fun because of being a beach episode. At least that's true until around halfway through the show when it really starts to settle in that it's made a definitive shift towards being more consistently funny. Diving into the meat of the show's center, I don't want to run the risk of trying to over-explain a series that is mostly experiential. The outfits just keep getting better and better, and Kagami is in my opinion an absolute style icon and androgynous god. I want her and Tsukasa's entire wardrobes, but maybe toned down a little to earthier colors. Personally, I tend to think the oversaturated Instagram ad clothing style that looks like this show translates poorly to most real-life scenarios, and uh, realistically exists to be worn to take selfies in bed next to string lights. When this video reaches 25,000 views, just as is the case with my Cardcaptor Sakura video, I will create a video ranking every single outfit in this show. It may seem odd that I've tried to downplay Lucky Star's status as a classic while including it in my series of videos on anime classics, but I felt the need to talk about it not only because it's a classic to me personally, but also because it is sort of reputationally classic to myself and my generation of anime fans. Back in 2014, I was the first mid-size anime YouTuber to sing the praises of shows like Lucky Star and K-On, and it sparked a massive wave of people talking about and spreading those shows around, turning their reputational memory from something sort of derided in the popular consciousness of the anime sphere to a more respectful perspective that reflects the status of those shows in Japan. A reputation which would be bolstered massively by sources like Sakuga Blog when they started covering Kyoto Animation extensively in the coming years. When I asked my viewers what anime I should pick for the letter L, a lot of comments suggested that I practically had to pick Lucky Star because I was the right person to sing the importance of the show. But the reason that's the case is that the show was specifically important mostly to people like me. While I'd gotten to understand the Japanese otaku experience to some degree from watching Genshiken and keeping up with bilingual bloggers and the like online, that series had been meant to give more of a realistic perspective on the otaku experience. Lucky Star instead is a fantastical version of that experience. Experience. Konata is an audience stand-in for all intents and purposes, except that she happens to be the tiniest, most adorable little natural athlete in the world, and gets to spend all of her time hanging out with the cutest twin shrine maidens and the beautiful Miyuki-chan. Beyond the far-flung fantastical power fantasies and sexual escapades of other anime shows, is there much else that the average otaku really wants out of life than what Konata has? I think the real power in Lucky Star is creating a comforting reflection of the self for the audience. A portrait of you divided from the incel qualities which are keeping you from having these kinds of friends in real life. Even the fact that Konata shares her voice with Haruhi, who already made a powerful audience stand-in character for a lot of viewers like me who saw ourselves in her instead of in Kyon, adds to the layers of identification which all really merge when Konata goes to see her own voice actress performing as Haruhi in concert and is so emotionally moved by the experience that she's still in her feelings all the way home. That had been the moment which really sold this show to me the first time I watched it through. Given that Lucky Star is comprised of mostly fairly disconnected scenes, there are certain moments from the show that had a lot more impact than anything else. Konata's teacher taking home the Christmas cake is probably the first exposure most American fans had to that cultural joke, and the next episode's trip to Comic Market, wherein Kagami discovers boys love for the first time and slowly begins her Fujo descent, probably introduced a few ideas to a whole lot of fans. Anime Tencho also appears in several episodes, being an obscure marketing character created by Gainax to promote Animate in the 90s, which is probably the place where I first learned about animator Imaishi Hiroyuki, and bridged the gap between having been a fan of G Gundam years before and learning learning about Blazing Transfer Student and Blue Blazes, all from the anime Tencho character designer in the coming years. In this way, Lucky Star is like a rabbit hole whose walls are full of other rabbit holes. In the second half, the show filters in the rest of its surprisingly large supporting cast. A few of these characters get more fleshed out than others, and I remember feeling surprised by how much I felt like the show could have kept going with all these new characters, but figured it probably wouldn't after ending in a pretty finalizing way. Eventually, two of the characters did get a spin-off show, which I will make another video about, along with the manga and any other piece of Lucky Star tie-in media that I can find in English when this video reaches 50,000 views. Probably the most memetically memorable of these characters 
ended up being the foreign exchange student in anime otaku Patty, whose adorable broken Japanese also helped to win over the hearts of the non-Japanese audience. In all honesty, I can't imagine myself ever probably watching the entirety of Lucky Star in order in the way that I did in the times that I had marathoned it with my best friend in 2007 and 9, or with my brother in 2014, and just now for the sake of this video. I've talked about in the past how anime that exist for healing and relaxation don't tend to appeal to me, as I am more comforted by constant chaotic experiences, like scrolling through my Twitter feed retweeting every piece of cool art I see, or listening to loud music and watching anime sped up at the same time time as a means of decompression, rather than slowing things down. All of the shows that ended up appealing to me in this genre were specifically the conversationally fixated ones, because, as you may have noticed by now, I am not capable of shutting myself up. I struggled to have meaningful conversations for a very long time because of my insecurity over my identity, which made it difficult for me to figure out my own intentions and what I wanted from interactions. But now that I don't have those issues anymore, I feel like I can be more selective about what conversations I think are particularly interesting or engaging to return to. To. There are definitely cool scenes in this show that I can see individually returning to, or even just looking up funniest Lucky Star moments and watching like a compilation or something, and I think this is easily a show that deserves to come up when you're scrolling through YouTube shorts just as much as Family Guy or Rick and Morty or whatever. I think the lasting emotional impact of Lucky Star on its audience was made mostly possible by its pair of more dramatic scenes in episodes 22 and 24, coinciding also with the resolution of the Lucky Channel subplot. The ghost of Konata's mother spectating her entire life can't help but tug at the heartstrings, and stands out just for the fact that something which makes a lot of people cry was slipped into this otherwise very dry comedy series. The last episode also adds a certain sense of closure and finality to the story, giving the girls a big stage performance as the series closer, pulling a page from Haruhi's book which Manabi Strait had also just added to this genre not long beforehand, and which Kayon was going to take above and beyond in both of its seasons. I can't say that the emotional highs of Lucky Star come anywhere close to those of Kaon, but in a way, that makes it much more of a throw-and-go type of experience than that show, which is better holistically. The Lucky Star OVA is luckily the best of what the show has to offer, and on its own, I can more easily see rewatching that one episode over and over than doing the rest of the series. But I'm gonna wait to talk about that and about the short spin-off ONA series Miyakawa Ke no Kufuku until this video reaches 50,000 views as per the usual anime alphabet sequel bargain. Help me to reach that view count by sharing this video with anyone you think would be interested. Did Kyoto Animation accomplish everything they were setting out to do with Lucky Star? I find that pretty doubtful. Was it still overall a great show and a decent success? Yeah. It'll always be meaningful to me, even if it's not necessarily as important to me now as it was at the time. And there's been tons and tons of stuff that's come in the genre that I think has exceeded it at this point. But just for having such a unique tone, palette, and design sense, and sense of humor, I do think that Lucky Star still holds up as something really interesting and remarkable to this day. Thanks again for watching. You can find more of my writing on goldenwitch.substack.com, support me on patreon.com slash goldenwitchfire, or by following at goldenwitchfire on all the social media and payment platforms. Listen to me review hip-hop albums on the Jittery Zeitgeist podcast, and listen to the new Void Gazers podcast, latest episode talking about weird things that turn us on over on the ASE Presents channel. Check all that out. Thanks again for watching and never forget, anime forever.